Hey, and welcome to River City Online. We're excited to have you join us today. As we get started, please take a moment to say hi in the chat and let us know that you are here.
Hey, and welcome to River City Online. We're excited to have you join us today. As we get started, please take a moment to say hi in the chat and let us know that you are here. We anticipate that we will experience God's presence today as we worship together. So feel free to connect with your host anytime and ask for prayer. We hope you have a great day.
I am grateful to be here. I'm just that you would be here to learn more about Jesus is just awesome. Uh, and that is our, my hope. Um, Kevin said, could you just let us know a little bit about you? And, you know, I mean, the older you get, the longer that story is. So when I was three, no, I won't. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, I grew up in Portland, Oregon. And so I am pretty much a Northwest uh, boy. I spent a couple stints leading an organization that was based in Chicago and being a youth pastor in Detroit. But other than that, it's all been uh, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. So I've had the opportunity to um, be a youth pastor. Uh, like Kevin said, I've been a professor both at uh, Trinity Western up in British Columbia as well as Western Seminary in Portland. Um, my uh, last kind of service in a church, I was uh, uh, a campus pastor at a church in Portland called the Mago Day Community. And um, uh, I led the staff in spiritual formation, and kind of led the, the church that way, uh, at one of our campuses, our main campus anyway. Uh, and then about four years ago, <clears throat> I transitioned to three-quarter time. Um, which gives me a little more time to play with my kids and grandkids. I have um, four adult children and 12 grandchildren. So uh, the only time I really resent that is when I'm going Christmas shopping. But, uh, <laughs> but other than that, it's a great time. Um, and so uh, I, I work three-quarter time at Western, like um, Kevin said, directing a Center for Pastoral Flourishing. And basically, uh, one of the things that I try and do is help pastors not do something that will get them fired and to help pastors love their job. And you'd think that both of those would be pretty easy for a pastor, but they're prone to get themselves in trouble, you know. Uh, so um, uh, when I met Kevin, the amazing thing to me really, you know, I mean, wanted to say what he liked about me it was, uh, so I do a class the third year of, of the program he was in on spiritual uh, formation and development. And so we were doing this thing called listening prayer. And Kevin's like going, I do this every day. You know, I'm going, yes, this is good because that's a quality of health. Because there are other pastors who are going, what is this thing we're doing? You know, and you're kind of going, okay. Uh, and I remember when I was a youth pastor, I went to this conference. Um, and there was a guy named Jim Burns, who's my, my counterpart as far as age goes. So he'd been doing youth ministry forever. And he said, okay, we're, we're going to do an advanced youth ministry seminar. And it, um, you have to be in ministry five years in order to do it. And so I went, I qualify for that. So I got in there, and the first thing he did was say, this is a Bible, and now, <laughs> now I'm going to show you how to devotionally listen to God through your Bible and how to pray. And, you know, it was after about five years that most, most people who knew how to do that started just doing ministry without those things. And so I really appreciate it when I find a pastor that hasn't moved on from praying in the Word and that he calls his people to it. And so, um, like Kevin said, I get invited to speak, not a lot, but often enough that, you know, I am busy and tired. And um, so I look for people that I can partner with rather than just one and dones. And so uh, I'm here because I believe that there's a work going on that that we uh, fan the flame on each other. And so I'm glad to be with some other Christians and partners in the gospel ministry together. Um, I'm going to start by reading you a, a prayer that I prayed this morning, okay? Um, wasn't really there until uh, Kevin kind of introduced that way and gave me the freedom to kind of listen for what God wanted. So that's what I'm going to do here. Uh, if I can get this out of here. Okay. So this is just a book of prayers. They're actually called liturgies. And the one I'm going to read to you today is called Liturgy Before Taking the Stage. Okay? <laughs> so it was a prayer for me today. Uh, what I have to offer here, what, what have I to offer here that might sustain the souls of others? Alone, I have little more to show beneath the scrutiny of lights than my own pride and insecurity, my craving for praise, my fear of rejection. Rather, let me offer something greater in this place, O Christ. As I step onto the stage, meet me amidst the wreckage of my own ego and my woundedness, and through me, give what I, I alone cannot. I offer you all I have, 
my talents, my training, my years spent preparing, my passions, my personality, my history, the many sacrifices I and others have made for this to be possible. And I give you even my brokenness of which I am a steward. I offer now these incomplete and insufficient provisions, remembering how you in your days among us, twice blessed and adequate offerings, fashioned them into miraculous feasts and would sustain crowds in their hard journeys. I pray that you would likewise receive and bless and multiply my meager gifts, Jesus, for the benefits of all who have gathered here. Let these humble elements in your hands become a true nourishment for those who hunger for you. And for those who have not wakened to their deepest hungers, let my brief service to them be the opening of a window through which the breezes of a fair country might blow, uh, stirring eternal longings to life. This tiny heap of my talents and my brokenness alike, this jumble of what is best and worst in me, meld it to a greater work with your spirit, using each facet as you will, so that even a sunset, a sunlight coursing through a cracked prism, you might grace somehow, revealing yourself to all who would listen. In whatever, be glorified. In whoever, be magnified. You, be fashioned and displayed." So that's my prayer for you. Thank you. My prayer for you and for me is that we would uh, be uh, sensitive to where God wants to lead us today. Uh, You're probably going to hear some things. You're probably going to watch me at some point stammer and stutter, and you're going to hear the Holy Spirit say, see what I've got to work with? I need you. And so uh, it really, we're not in control of um, how the blows are going to come or what's going to land. And so... uh, Could I just ask you to put your hands up uh, again and just receive right now? So, Father, uh, it's often that people pray that I might speak in a way that people hear. But it's rare that people would be prayed for as listeners. God, on the day of Pentecost, I don't believe that those people were speaking in all different languages. I believe they were just speaking and people heard it in their language. So would you give this crowd this group of gathered saints, the gift of hearing, that they might hear in your love language to them what you would have for them. In Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, you know, I've told you this big uh, sweeping view of Bill in ministry, uh, traveled around and that kind of stuff. Um, I would say that probably the biggest change in my life happened about 17 years ago. And it happened when my wife of 31 years died of ovarian cancer. She struggled with that for six years. And uh, we were planting a church in the midst of that. In fact, she contracted cancer just as we were starting to plant the church. And I looked at her and said, um, hey, I think we have enough equity in the house to live for two years. Let's just sell the house and, you know, let's make the best of this. And she looked at me and said, if I've only got two years left, let's plant a church. I'm going, okay, you know. So uh, um, it was a a great effort with her, and that church still exists today. In fact, uh, last Easter, uh, the pastor of that church called my uh, oldest son to be his youth and family pastor. So it's kind of fun to to see him uh, serving there as well. Um, I'm telling you all that because um, many of you might think your brokenness is the thing that's going to limit your ministry. And what happened to me was in the middle of a brokenness, God gave me a different ministry. One where I could hear people, one where I could be sensitive to hurt, one where I would understand that people just with their own skill set could do amazing things, but God breaks us so that he can do something supernatural rather than just a phenomenal thing, you know? And so I would hope that each of you today would understand that... um, The world does not deserve you. That's why God's built heaven. It's his trophy case. And you're going to be on display forever. Look what I did there. Look what I did in her. Look what I did in him. And we're all going to marvel at the great champion called Jesus, who who made each one of us from trash to trophy, you know? And so um, that's my hope, that you'd have that kind of vision, okay? So... 
I'm going to walk through three different stages today uh, looking at God's story and, and you, okay? Um, so for me, I grew up in, in going to church. My mom went to church. My dad wasn't a believer, and so she was a master of guilt. She would say, is this, you know, I'd be in bed, and she goes, is this where you want to be when the Lord would come? I'm going... I think I'm okay with that, you know, but she would guilt me into going to church with her. I, so I grew up in a church, um, uh, trusted Christ, uh, kind of went through a typical church cycle of high on Jesus at camp and carnal during the school year, okay? And then I got high on Jesus one year at camp, and unfortunately, it was right when I was going into my senior year in high school, so I didn't get a chance to carnal on down, and I went to Bible college, okay? <laughs> and so uh, God got a hold of me and didn't let go. Okay, as we look at that, though, I really do believe that I bought into something that was told to me as a little kid, and that's ask Jesus in your heart, okay? And so I did, and I kept thinking, I had this great big life called Bill, and Jesus was in my heart, you know? And whenever I couldn't get it done, I could call on the little guy and let him out, and he'd help me. <laughs> and uh, eventually, <laughs> uh, he showed me I didn't ask him into my heart. He invited me into his story. And, and he's the hero of the story. And he invites me to participate in the story he's telling to my neighbors, to you, to everybody that, that he allows me to encounter, that he's, he's visiting them through me. And when I could learn that, it, it, it changed a lot. So that's where I kind of want to look as we start this joining God in his story, not God joining you in yours. Okay? So, um, this is just kind of a, um, a wacky chart that I'm really grateful that Ryan was able to put together because I couldn't make it look right. Uh, and um, what it basically does is say, okay, in Genesis, here's the beginning, right? And it talks about the different things like God created heaven and earth. God created man in the garden. There was no death before the fall. There was a tree of life in the garden. There was no curse. But then if you look in Revelation, especially in chapters 21 and 22, as I've pointed out these verses here, you start saying God creates a new heaven and a new earth. That uh, God will dwell with man as he did in the garden. There's no death in the new creation, no death in the first creation. Jerusalem's supernatural, the garden was supernatural. There's a tree of life depicted in both. There's no curse in either. God will be worshipped in both. And you start realizing that the story of God was never at risk. You know, it wasn't though he had this story and then it was so fragile it depended on Adam and Eve's obedience. That even with their disobedience, God's story is intact. He's going to have a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth. God's going to uh, reign. Jesus will be king. I mean, it's not at risk. It's not at risk over the elections that just happened. It's not at risk over our country and whether or not it's an economic challenge. It's not at risk in your own obedience or not. God's story is not fragile. Okay? Okay? And he's inviting us into that stable story. Think about being an Israelite. And um, you're born at the time of King David. Okay? You have Abraham as, as a, a heritage father for your faith. You have a time where you were rescued out of Exodus. And, and now you've been made into this great nation. You're going, of course, this is what we're for. Now think about 200 years later, and we've had episode after episode after episode of sinful, idolatrous king, and God's about ready to punish you. Ten tribes in the north get destroyed and never rebuilt. Two in the south stay this little remnant called Judah or Israel the rest of the time in the, in the scriptures, but they're never the kingdom they were. Now if you're that person, you're going, uh, it does feel like the story's at risk, but it isn't, is it? You know, nations come and go, people come and go, we're called blades of grass, you know, we are players in the story, we're not the story, okay? And when we can see that, it gives us some groundedness to all the ways the story seems to be changing with every turn in our life, you know? So, the reason I tell you that, that is because for 31 years, I had this identity called husband. And in one day, it's gone. You know, I'm no longer a husband. 
Whatever that said to me, like put your clothes away, eat healthy, those are gone. <laughs> you know, couches become my new closet. Cocoa puffs became my new staple. You know, I mean, I, I can behave any way I want because the person who was an identity shaper giver is no longer part of my life. And I was in a free fall. And I hope that you don't ever have to be there. I hope that you can get an identity in Jesus. It's not crisis free, but it's crisis proof. You know, when Jesus lands the plane on his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, so he said, okay, here's the foolish man, here's the wise man. You remember how he says that? And the foolish man built his house on the sand, and the wise man built his house on the rock. And the winds came, and the floods came, and, and the rains came. Now, Americans have a tendency to read that. If I build my house on the rock, there'll be no wind. There'll be no rain. There'll be no flood. And when those come, we go, what the heck? I'm going to higher ground rather than Jesus saying, I never promise you no rains. Never promise you no floods. Never promise you no winds. I promise you it would be crisis proof, not crisis free. Okay? So we have a drama, that, a story that Jesus is telling where it seems like there's a lot of chaos going on between Genesis and Revelation. You know, and, and I want us to see he's telling us a story. He's letting us see who he is through this whole thing. So here's kind of like the big arc of his story. Creation, fall, where we fell um, through Adam and Eve and sin. Redemption, the work that Jesus does and consummation, that re resetting of the whole kingdom back to the way it started in Genesis, back to Revelation. Okay? So... That's the story arc, creation to consummation. When we get, are created, here are some things that happen. God gave us a dignity. We're called image bearers of God, okay? He gave us an attachment to the standpoint that we were one with him. When, you, when we get this picture that God came and walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, there was fellowship. In fact, actually, after the sin, they hid because that attachment had been broken, they were asked to obey, whether it happened to be cultivate the land or whether it happened to be name the animals. Uh, they were asked to obey. And again, that dignity gave them a sense of worth. Okay? That was all given to humans when God created them. At the fall, death entered into our psyche, into our world, into who we are. And we were, rather than attached to God, we became detached from Him. And that's spiritual death. Okay? Rather than obedience that was a loving expression, we start to feel like if I do something, I'm afraid that he's going to punish me. So if I do something, will he not punish me? And it becomes a transactional relationship with God rather than a functional relationship with God. Okay? And that then, in a sense, we disobey because we don't even know what he'd want. We're not attached to him. So in redemption, he gives us a new identity in who he is, right? In who he is. It takes us from detached fear to attached love again and restores us back to the relationship that he created us to have and invites us to participate with him in his story. And then at consummation, it gives us a hope of where God's going. It makes us confident in his, in his love that it's not performance-based or even his, uh, there's no limits to him so that that drives away our fear and it lets us understand we are most at home when we're in him, okay? I'm just telling you that's kind of like the big story. So when we look at this idea that dignity or the creation piece and the consummation piece come into our redemption piece, right? So even though we were broken at the fall with sin, it doesn't mean that we were broken as much as we could be, okay? So for example, the scriptures say the earth is cursed, right? In Romans, it says that the earth longs, it groans to be released from its curse, okay? And it's going to be. Well, the interesting thing to me is that I love strawberries, I, I can't imagine how much better a non-cursed strawberry is going to taste, you know? And, and I'm not even sure that necessarily the taste of a strawberry is cursed. 
It, it, there's a curse to the earth that involves thorns. It involves crop failures. It involves seasons that, that can devastate and, and uh, uh, predators or pestilence that, that can uh, ruin crops, okay? But I'm not necessarily sure that a strawberry's taste got cursed or a watermelon's taste got cursed. Maybe our taste is cursed and so we, we can't taste it as well. Maybe, you know, I don't, I don't know. I just... I do know that there are good things that are left after the fall. And there are good things left in people after the fall. There are people who can love. There are people who can forgive. There are people who can do kind things, just like strawberries and watermelons can taste good. There are people that have residual goodness about creation. Okay? So when sin happens... We are damaged beyond repair. We can't restore ourselves to God. And each one of you probably knows that. That it takes Jesus to be our mediator, to be our rescuer, to be our savior, to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. Okay? So all of those things have to happen. And yet at the same time, we'll look a little bit here in a minute. Uh, Just for example, in Luke 11... Jesus is speaking to a group of men. And he goes, you, though you are fathers and you're evil. So he recognizes their fallenness. He goes, even though you are fathers and you're evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children. When they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? No. You take care of them. So he's relating to them saying, see, you're not as fallen as you could be. You're not as evil as you could be, though you are evil. And then he says, how much more will your heavenly father give you the Holy Spirit if you were to ask? So he uses the picture of a fallen person able to do good things as an analogy to a good God who does good things. And this father actually images God even though the image is damaged. Okay? So... Our creation bears on our redemption and our hope and our love and no fear from, our, from the consummation part of the story. Both of those get to speak into us today. So I would like to write a book. Um, some of you go, I don't know why. Others of you, I don't want to read it. But uh, <laughs> uh, I want to write a book called Loving God in Three Days. Okay. And uh, rather than just day one, day two, day three, I want the three days to be yesterday, what we have from our created past that's good, tomorrow, what we hope for in our consummation, and today, right now. So we love God in three days. We love him with our past, we love him with our future, and we love him in the right now. You know? That, that's, that's what we're doing here. Okay? So, uh, this whole thing is called Salvation. And yet, that little piece there between fall and redemption, we're calling sanctification. That's the process of becoming like Jesus, okay? So, the, the, the hope, the whole story of God, it's accomplished. It's secure, okay? What we're in the midst of doing is applying, taking the fallen part and applying the redeemed part in its place. So where we have detachments from God, we're in the process of forming attachments with God. Where we live in fear, we're learning how to live in love, okay? Because perfect love drives out fear. So, so what we're trying to do is come to a place of being able to apply what God has already invited us into, okay? That's all Adam and Eve were being invited into. Live the story, And they chose their own script. And each one of us do regularly. And we need to re-script, renew, restore. Okay? So, uh, we move from fear mode to love mode in the sanctification process. Okay? So, I want to take a little bit of time here and just say, what's the difference between a story and a scene? Okay? And probably the easiest way for me to... um, 
do that is what's a show that you might watch on TV on a regular basis? Okay, you know, don't, don't worry about it. No one's going to judge you. You're going, and I'll just tell you, I, I liked Breaking Bad when it was on, okay? <laughs> uh, and uh, so, so what, what's a story, what, what's a TV show that you might watch? The Chosen, okay, nice and safe, okay, way to go. <laughs> All right, so you, you've got The Chosen, okay? So there's a story to The Chosen, but every once in a while we get drawn into, I, I love Matthew's character, you know, but, but we get drawn into Matthew and, and all that's going on, whether it's, it's that he's OCD about being the accountant or whether, you know, it, it's just questions and logistics that he has about how we're going to feed these people or what we're going to do when we go to Jerusalem and people are talking bad about Jesus. He's a, he's a manager, you know, he's just trying to manage everything, okay? So we get little scenes about Matthew, but the story's not about Matthew. He just makes the story embellished, okay? So when it's a story, it usually begins and has continuity and it tells a message and it involves people, hopefully, and it's engaging, okay? Where on the scene side of things, it can begin, but it most often just continues, okay? So the story is going in. You can watch a, an episode of The Chosen and you're going, we didn't move any further along in the story this time. But we saw Mary Magdalene run away. Okay? So uh, there was a big part of that and how we're going to go get her, whatever's involved in that kind of thing. So it, it begins, but it moves. It has continuity. Um, it, it's not really um, self-contained in an episode, but it is from the standpoint, it, it'll continue, but there was a little bit of a story that was told, right? It embellishes the message so you get to see it in a different way. So Jesus is loving, and then you get to see him love Matthew. Jesus is loving is a storyline. Now you get to see him uh, love Mary, you know? It embellishes what love looks like, okay? And it informs the observers so that you're watching that going, Maybe he could love me too. Okay? So what I want you to see is that you've been invited to live out a scene. Okay? So just figure out your name. That's not too hard. You've been at, had it for a while. So uh, Kevin Beeson has been invited to live in a scene his entire life called Kevin Beeson. He's that character in the story of God. And he lives that character day by day, and each day is a scene making up an entire character profile of Kevin Beeson, but it's not the Kevin Beeson story. It's the God story, and Kevin Beeson's a character in it, telling the God story through how he relates, how he uh, processes data, how he responds to trauma. He tells, I believe in a loving God. He forgives, I believe in a forgiving God. He is able to make peace because I experience the peace of God. He's telling the story of God with his scene, okay? And each one of us gets to do that. So if we were to look at that as a, that's your scene called your life, okay? And we've got scene and scene and scene and scene. And I'm going to show you kind of a cone that I think is going to tell the story of God. And it's wrapped all around with scenes. So that even though the story is being told, the texture is being compi compiled, okay? So what that would look like here would be... Um, See, th those, are the, those are the scenes that are spiraling around it, okay? So if we were to look at the kingdom of God, then prior to creation, now in creation, we're also going to look at the kingdom of God now in creation and not yet, new creation, okay? So this is the first half of this cone. It's going to kind of make like a bow tie. So we have Adam. We're pretty familiar with him, first uh, guy. Uh, all humanity... Uh, comes out of Adam. But all humanity was inheriting this great life with God, and Adam sinned, so now all humanity inherits this stunted, fallen, um, you know, life that, that has been marred, that has been wrecked. So Abraham 
is chosen by God to say, I'll make a people out of you. So out of the big fallen pond of humanity, God goes back to saying, no, I'll make a, a, something with you. And then uh, Abraham and the people of Israel live in captivity for 400 years in Egypt. And God says, time is up. I want to make you a people, you a nation. I want to tell more of my story through you. And so he brings Moses into the situation and he gives a code. Okay, we call it the law. But there's codes for how to worship, codes for how to be neighbor, codes for even how, how to take care of yourself, okay? Uh, if you were to just look at, for example, the Ten Commandments, remember how Jesus said, here, here, let's just wrap it all up. Let's summarize it this way, love God and love others. Well, if you look at the Ten Commandments, you see the first four deal with loving God and the last six deal with loving others. That's all it is, basically, you know? Um, don't have any other gods before you. Keep the Sabbath holy. You know, uh, don't commit adultery. That's love your neighbor, but not that much. Okay, so, uh, so as we kind of uh, look at the whole idea of what's it going to look like, um, uh, we have a people that start to be defined with unique behaviors in a world that doesn't recognize them. So then eventually there's a king to represent the king of God's kingdom. We're telling the story now with David as a king to a people of Israel. But then the kingdom divides north and south like we've talked about. The north gets taken over by Assyria. And Assyria has just this insidious strategy for ruining the identity of a people. And that's take half of the people out and put other people in its place. Okay, so if Assyria, for example, has um, already taken over, um, let's just say uh, they took over part of Turkey, okay, and now they come in and they take over northern Israel. So they take, uh, let's say, 5,000 people from Turkey and 5,000 people from northern Israel, and they swap them, okay? And then they take 5,000 from somewhere else that they've captured and 5,000 more from northern Israel and swap them. So that eventually this northern Israel has... A pretty much a, a mixed pool, right? <laughs> That's why the Jews in the New Testament wanted nothing to do with them. They were half-breeds. And that's why the woman at Sychar in John 4, the woman at the well, is able to say, our father, Jacob, worshipped at this well. She's tying in to her Jewish story she's always had, where half of the people there aren't Jews, so they don't have that story, and they aren't a people, so they don't even have a people story, okay? That, that was the way to ruin their identity. So this kingdom divides, and there's a remnant left um, that goes into captivity for 70 years in Babylon, and then comes back and rebuilds into the nation Israel that we're familiar with. But can you see how the cone's going from humanity to a group of people through Abraham, to a group of people who obey the law, to a kingdom, to half a kingdom, all right, we're, we still, you're saying we still have a chance. There's a possibility we'll have a Messiah, a deliverer, and then it just goes silent for 400 years. Almost twice the amount of time that we've been a nation. They don't hear anything. It'd be pretty hard to keep believing during that time, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know? So, this kind of gives us a picture of a diminishing return on the reign of death, okay? This cone kind of ends with the cross here, and Jesus is seen as the second Adam who defeats the death that came into the story through the first Adam. Jesus is a second Abraham who gives us the opportunity to be the children of God, the seed of Abraham, okay? Uh, he's he fulfills the law of Moses so that you and I are no longer condemned through Christ. We have freedom and forgiveness. And he's the king. He's a better king than David was, okay? So that then he defeats this whole idea of death by his resurrection, okay? If we were to look at the idea, uh, Jesus then kind of becomes the climax to the story, the end of the story. I mean, this is it. You know, have you ever watched a, uh, a movie and you've got about 10 minutes less than a movie, but everything's been wrapped up. The hero's won. He's got the girl. You know, the dog's back in the house. E everything's, everything's turned out great, okay? Um, and then you've got about 10 more minutes of, oh, and John now lives in Connecticut. And Susie now, you know, is on the West Coast and has a boutique store, you know? And it just kind of gives you the, the, uh, the spoils of the story, so to speak, right? That's, that's what we're living in right now. 
the big story was Jesus died and ruined sin and restored a pathway for us to be with God. And, oh, and Kevin pastors a church in Lewiston. And Bill lives in Wenatchee. I mean, we're just the bylines to the great story that Jesus has done. It's his story, you know? We are grateful for the Word of God and thrilled that you joined us today. We hope you experience God's presence and will continue to experience Him throughout this week. If this is your first time checking out RCC Online, please text RCC New to 97000. And if you surrendered your life to Jesus and want to know more about walking with Him, please text RCC Life to 97000. You can also stick around and chat with your online host. Have a great week.